So welcome everyone. I appreciate everybody logging in tonight on this uh, nice night. Um, as Lev mentioned, the chat box is open. And so we're going to um, pop out to the chat throughout the presentation. Feel free to put some questions there. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to take a look at those as we go. Um, but definitely wanted to make sure that my, you guys had my uh, contact information and email here. We're going to do a very high level overview today. So should you uh, have some specific questions that you want to address with me um, related to your situation after the presentation, feel free to contact me um, in either method. I'm, I'm happy to take some time to talk to you specifically about your needs. Um, so with that, let's get started. Um, so we started doing this presentation, gosh, a number of years ago because Medicare comes at people pretty fast. Um, at about six or and a half, your mailbox starts filling up with more uh, collateral from insurance companies than you could possibly imagine. And uh, everything that sort of you've been doing in the healthcare system up until you turn 65 has either come from an employer sponsored group or maybe union coverage or your spouse's coverage. Maybe you've had to go to the Affordable Care Act in the marketplace and be self insured for some time. But um, there's, you know, limited choice in the marketplace currently. And so th this whole idea of choosing deductibles and coinsurance and max out of pocket amounts, um, it can be a little bit overwhelming and daunting. Um, not to mention the process just to get to Medicare has its own set of rules. And so we're going to talk about all that today on a very high level. Um, as an independent insurance broker, I work with virtually all the insurance insurance companies, the major insurance companies in the state of Illinois. I am licensed in other states as well. Um, and so as a broker, I have no bias, um, but I, I definitely want to help you find the coverage that meets your needs, your budget, your lifestyle, because you do have a lot of choice. This is a highly competitive space. Um, but a lot of people, before they want to sit down with a broker, they often like to do their own research. And so there's a couple government resources that I like to point people to right off the bat that I think is really helpful um, for people to know about. One is this Medicare and You book that I have up on the screen here. Now, this publication um, is available for download on the Medicare website, and I'll show a screen grab of that in a second. Um, but you can also, it will also get mailed to you once you are enrolled in Medicare. And so if you're coming new to Medicare, and I don't know, Lev, if we were going to do a poll at the top of the hour um, or here, I can launch it right now. Um, I just put a poll on the screen. Uh, to get a sense of, of our audience tonight, if we have folks that are new to Medicare or if you're already in Medicare and you're just looking for a refresher, maybe you made some planned decisions a number of years ago and you're just kind of wondering what else might be out there. But if people want to answer the poll, it looks like we have a lot of folks coming new to Medicare in the near term here. Okay, so I'll try to address some of the key enrollment um, items as well. All right, thank you for for responding to that. So one of the things that many of you probably don't have at your disposal is this Medicare and You book. But like I said, you can download it um, right off the website. And this publication does two things really well. Um, it's written in government speak, and so it's a tremendous sleeping aid. If you ever have a hard time sleeping at night, it'll probably knock you down in about five minutes flat after reading a few pages. But it also answers a lot of the basic questions about Medicare A and B coverage, when to enroll, what's the deal with these penalties, um, how does Part D work? How does Part C work? And so it's a good start. The second thing that I like a lot is this website, Medicare.gov. Now I want to point you to this URL. .gov, G-O-V, is the federal government website. Medicare.com, if you go there, that's a sales site. And if you type in your name and information looking for a free quote or for you know somebody to give you a call, your phone's gonna start ringing off the hook. So just know that anything that ends in .gov, just like socialsecurity.gov, the SSA.gov and Social Security Administration site, that's the federal government website. And this is really where you wanna be. All of these blue buttons at the top are drop downs. And you, it'll go pages and pages deep where you can get all kinds of information about just about anything you need. You can also use this search bar function. 
the one button I like is this one down in the bottom right hand corner um, where it talks about finding plans and we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in a little later in the presentation but up here in this far right upper right hand corner this forms help and resources tab that's where you can download that Medicare and book okay if you don't have one yet if it hasn't been mailed to you so the Medicare and book the website all good places and then also um, the Medicare phone number, 1-800-MEDICARE. A lot of people will initially call Social Security because you do your enrollment with Medicare Part A and B with the Social Security office. But once you're in Medicare and then subsequently thereafter, if you, if you have questions about your Medicare benefits, 1-800-MEDICARE is a wonderful phone number to call. Those folks are staffed on that phone line 24-7 um, almost 365 days a year. They're closed for about six national holidays. Um, and you know, if you're lying awake at night wondering what you should do about your prescription drug coverage during the Medicare annual enrollment, um, they'll be happy to take your call. So they're a really good um, point of access, 1-800-MEDICARE. So those are the three government sites that I like a lot in addition to the social security site. This is where your journey begins, Medicare Part A and B. Okay, and as I mentioned, this is something that you have to do with the Social Security Office. You can't do this with a health insurance agent, okay? Because this is between you and the federal government. Now, people have this initial enrollment window when they first turn 65. It actually starts three months before your birthday month, and it ends three months after your birthday month. And you can enroll in Medicare at any time during that window, okay? The one thing to remember, though, is everybody's eligible for their benefits starting on the first of the month in which they turn 65. The only people who might be eligible a little sooner um, are two types of people. People that come to Medicare early via disability. So if you're declared disabled and you are taking um, disability benefits, on the 25th month that you're on disability, you qualify for Medicare A and B. Now you don't have to take it, but you would be eligible to get it under age 65. That's the only circumstance in which people, that and if they have some chronic conditions like end-stage renal disease, um, Lou Gehrig's disease, would they qualify for Medicare early? Otherwise, the rest of us have to wait until our 65th birthday. Now, if your birthday happens to land on the first of a month, you'll actually qualify to activate your benefits the month prior. But for the rest of us, if our birthday is on the date of the second or any other day of the month, our benefits will start on the first of that month. So if you want your benefits to start then, go ahead and enroll anytime during this three month window prior. If you wait till your actual birthday month, they're gonna delay your Part B benefits um, one month. And if you delay in any of these back half, these back three months, they're gonna delay them even further by a subsequent two and three months, just depending on when you enroll. Now. In my parents' generation, most people, when they turned 65, that was kind of the end of the line. They would retire, they would you know, go on and take their grandkids fishing, and they'd fire up Medicare. And that's why if you look at some of our senior population, if you look at their Medicare cards, you'll see the exact same month and year for Part A and B. But the baby boomers are really changing this dynamic. You know, many of the folks that are now turning 65, they like their jobs. They're working past age 65. They like the socialization, they like the paycheck, and they're not ready to come to Medicare yet. And that's fine, they don't have to. If you have employer-sponsored coverage, and that coverage covers more than 20 employees, okay, then you can wait and defer on your Medicare benefits without penalty. Now, some people might turn on their Medicare Part A benefit, and that's because if you've worked 10 years or 40 quarters in your working life and you've contributed into the Social Security system, Medicare Part A won't have an additional premium for you when you turn 65. But everybody pays an additional premium for Medicare Part B. So sometimes if people continue to work and have their employer-sponsored insurance, they might turn on Part A just to get in the system, but that, that Part A benefit is sitting behind your employer benefit as secondary to your group coverage. Okay, It's not costing you anything extra, so it's okay to turn it on. Um, the only people I typically tell not to turn on Part A if they continue to work is those folks that have high deductible health plans and by virtue of having that kind of a health plan through their employer, they're able to contribute to a healthcare savings account, an HSA, um, and they're, they're able to do that tax-free. And that's why in a lot of the government publications that you'll read, you'll sometimes see 
uh, verbiage that advises you to stop contributing to an HSA six months ahead of your Medicare enrollment. And that's because Medicare Part A can be backdated up to six months, but no further than the first of the month in which you turn 65. So sometimes this will be turned on and then somebody might wait until they're 67 or 68 and then they'll finally retire, step off of their employer coverage and they'll go back to social security to turn on their Part B. Okay, you have a lot of options right now in terms of how to enroll for Medicare. If you're new to Medicare and you're coming prior to your birthday or in, the, in this seven month window, you can go online to sign up for Part A and B. You don't necessarily have to take your Social Security benefits. You can certainly turn on Medicare before doing that. Um, but if you do, you'll get billed quarterly for your Part B premium. Um, for those that already have A and they want to turn on B, because our social security offices are closed for in-person appointments right now due to COVID, um, you can fax in your Part B application or you can go online to submit it. Um, but you will need a second form that represents your coverage that you've had um, that, has, that has delayed your enrollment to Part B without penalty, and that's called a proof of prior coverage form. You can get it on medicare.gov, or if anybody needs that urgently, you know, just send me a quick email after the seminar and I'll be happy to send you those forms. So Medicare Part A and B, you can start them at different times but you do have to have that qualified coverage to reserve your place to come to Medicare late without penalty. Now, sometimes people will look at whether or not they should keep their employer group insurance or go to Medicare. Sometimes it's a better value to go to Medicare. But one thing to know about that Medicare Part B premium is this year the base premium starts at 144.60 per person per month. But the Social Security office bases that premium on how you've earned your living and in terms of how much you've made. So what they're gonna look at were the taxes that you filed in um, 2020, which was actually, you know, or what you filed in 19, which is what you made in 18. That's what they have at their disposal currently. Now, pretty soon here, they're gonna have the taxes that you filed um, for, well, no, they won't have 20, they won't have 2019s until you file for 2020. But if you're a joint filer, that first break point is 174K in modified adjusted gross. Um, so that'll be what is reported income on your, in, in your 2018 year, which is what was on your 2019 taxes that you just submitted. Okay. If you're an individual filer, that first break point is 87K in modified adjusted gross. And so your Part B premium could be adjusted if you made a higher wage and it could be adjusted upward to this higher amount. So sometimes that's why people also will wait to turn on Medicare Part B because their employer-sponsored insurance typically is subsidized from a premium perspective and it might cost them less. They also might be carrying some dependents because when you come to Medicare, you can't carry dependents. It's a single payer system in and the benefits are single out. So Medicare Part B is adjusted. Okay, this is the 10,000 foot view of Medicare that I like to show people. It's, it's kind of my, the Goodyear blimp view of Medicare, so to speak. This handout was probably sent to you by the library um, prior to this webinar. And if you didn't get it, um, like I said, just shoot me an email and I can send it to you after the fact. But Medicare Part A and B um, is great coverage, but that's basically where your coverage will begin. Now we're gonna break down those benefits in detail so you can see exactly what A and B cover, but more importantly, what they don't cover and what your coinsurance and deductible and copay responsibilities are under the core benefits of original Medicare, okay? Because while it's really good coverage, it was never designed to be complete coverage. There was always this idea that the beneficiary, you, um, would have some skin in the game. You would be paying for some part of your Medicare coverage beyond your Part B premium, okay? So let's break that down. Medicare Part A. This is the part for most Americans that doesn't have a, an additional premium. However, if you haven't paid into the Social Security system for 10 years or 40 working quarters, or you don't have a spousal benefit that you can take advantage of, where your spouse worked that amount of time, then you might have a premium associated with Medicare Part A, and you would need to turn it on immediately at age 65 or face a penalty. But Part A is a benefit that really covers 
the majority of the facilities you're gonna come in contact with in Medicare. Certainly there's no more important facility than the hospital, okay? So it covers your inpatient care if you're ever admitted into the hospital. It also covers skilled nursing. This might be a rehab facility after a hospitalization. It may be a post-acute care center, um, any, kind of, any kind of skilled nursing facility. And that's gonna be a limited benefit, which, which we'll talk about in a, in a bit, but it does cover you um, for a good number of days while you're in skilled nursing. Home health services. Um, these services are medically necessary. They're short-term in duration. Uh, it's a Medicare approved provider, so you just can't pick whoever you want. And your doctor will typically write an order for this. Um, and so you may have you know, subsequent orders that are, are rewritten by your doctor, but someone is coming to your home to do medically necessary things. So it might be a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner that is changing wound dressings after an operation or maybe they're administering injectable medications that you can't do yourself. Or maybe you're getting a handful of physical therapy visits in the privacy of your own home before you're strong enough to take yourself to an external PT facility, okay? Um, so again, short-term in duration and a Medicare approved provider doing medically necessary things. And then hospice is your last benefit um, under Medicare Part A. Generally, whether it's in-home hospice or you're in a facility, whether it's end-of-life hospice or it's hospice that later would lead you to back to palliative care, um, it is a benefit that is covered under Medicare Part A. So let's look at the financial impact of this for you because I mentioned before that there's no cost for this insurance for most Americans, but you do have some financial exposure under this piece of Medicare. The first bit of financial exposure you have is your inpatient hospital care, okay? The first night that you're actually admitted into the hospital, so they change your status, maybe, maybe you come in through the ER and they keep you under observation one night, but then they finally make a diagnosis, they know how they're gonna treat you and they admit you. That admission is gonna trigger a copay that you're responsible for of $1,408 for night one, okay? So that's a pretty big amount. But it's not as daunting as that because that benefit window actually extends for 60 days. So let's say you went in for an inpatient procedure, maybe it was elective, maybe you came in via an emergent situation, but you're hospitalized and later discharged um, on the fifth night. Well, you're actually covered upon discharge up until day 60 for that single copay amount. So if you were particularly unhealthy or unlucky and you had a readmission three, four weeks later, Medicare wouldn't ask you for this copay a second time. But let's say six months later, it's now winter time and you're out shoveling your driveway and you slip and fall on the ice and break your leg and you have to go back into the hospital, um, then you're gonna get tagged with that copay a second time. So on day 61, this resets, okay? Um, skilled nursing is another wonderful benefit. Um, days one through 20 are covered by Medicare at 100%, but I have an asterisk on this benefit. There's a lot of nuances within the Medicare system, partial sentences, half truths, a lot of floating asterisks that if you didn't know were there, you could get yourself caught up in some additional out-of-pocket costs. And I certainly need to put an asterisk by this skilled nursing benefit because these first 20 days that Medicare will pay for, they actually have a trigger. And that trigger is that you need to be coming out of an inpatient hospitalization with three nights under admitted status. So when you're in Medicare, if you're ever hospitalized you, you ha and you think you're going to go on to skilled nursing, before you're discharged, you definitely want to know what your status is. How many nights were under observation? How many nights were under admission? Because if you don't have those three nights under admitted status, this bill is going to be on you for the first 20 days. But if you have the three nights admission, Medicare will pay for this, so at no cost to you. If you find yourself in skilled nursing or rehab for longer than 20 days, Days 21 through 100, so the next 80, Medicare is still going to support you, but they're going to ask you for a copay of $176. And this is a per day charge. So $176 per day for days 21 through 100. That's going to be on you. And then if you're 
stay extends beyond your 100th day, then Medicare considers that long-term care and they, are, they do not pro provide long-term care insurance. That's a whole separate set of insurance for a whole separate seminar, okay? So that's when you would either need to start paying for your skilled nursing stay out of your assets or pull out a long-term care policy. Home health services, as I mentioned before, those are covered at 100%. Um, really no cost share to you. And for hospice, we basically say that, you know, end of life hospice, you might be filling some prescriptions to keep you comfortable um, to the tune of maybe 5% coinsurance, but generally hospice is also covered at 100%. So that's Medicare Part A. No premium, but definitely exposure. As you incur these events, this would be your financial responsibility, okay? Medicare Part B, now this works a little bit different. And this is the lion's share of what you're gonna come in contact with in the healthcare system when you're in Medicare. A good portion of things bill up under Medicare Part B. So this is why you have that associated premium on a per month basis for this insurance. It's gonna be all your doctors. They're gonna bill up under B whether it's the physicians that you see in their office on a regular basis, specialist, primary care, um, or it's the surgeon that operates on you and does your knee replacement or your hip replacement, okay? Their, their services are gonna bill up under B. Any kind of lab tests, so a blood panel, a biopsy, um, any of that type of stuff goes up under Part B as a lab service. Diagnostic testing are the expensive alphabet soup. I like to call this because everything that really has a letter in front of it is, is a diagnostic test typically nowadays, an EKG, an EEG, an MRI, PET scan, CAT scan. Those are all gonna bill up under Medicare Part B as a diagnostic test, an MRI. Durable medical equipment, certainly this is a walker or a wheelchair, but it could also be a pacemaker. Um, maybe a COPD machine to help you sleep at night, maybe an insulin pump if you're diabetic, your lancets and test strips, even though the, you get those at the pharmacy, um, they bill up under your medical plan, not your drug plan. Physical therapy or pain and torture, as a lot of my clients like to call it, um, that's covered under Medicare Part B. Um, emergency services, if you visit the ER. The ambulance transport to and from the hospital. You might be admitted once you get there, but that Part A coinsurance, that, that's the bright lights in the gurney, the nice comfy bed that you get to sleep in once you're admitted. But the ambulance transport to and from the facility is actually gonna bill up under B. Now outpatient services is becoming a bigger and bigger bucket nowadays. Not only would this be an observational night in the hospital, but it could also be a surgical procedure where you're in and out in the same day. And there's a lot of those going on nowadays. Um, a few years ago, my husband had a you know, full hernia surgery. He checked in at Northwestern at eight o'clock in the morning and was out by one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I've had clients have full hip and knee replacements done on an outpatient basis. And so this, is, this could be a, a fairly significant service charge under Part B. And then clinical Rx, um, these are the more serious medications that typically are going to be administered in a clinical setting or a doctor's office. Infusion therapy, um, kidney dialysis, chemotherapy, maybe you get joint injections for osteoporosis or some, some chronic um, rheumatoid arthritis conditions. A lot of those will bill up under Medicare Part B as clinical Rx. And that works a little bit differently in terms of your out-of-pocket financial exposure. There is a monthly premium, yes, and it'll be based on your tax filings, but base premium will be 144.60 at a minimum. And then on top of that, you're gonna have $198 deductible, but that's annual, okay? So for those of you who are coming off of the Affordable Care Act, you're probably carrying deductibles that are in the thousands of dollars. I think the the most generous employer group plan I saw had a $250 to $500 annual deductible for an individual. Typically, families have a higher deductible. So that's, that's a pretty nice deductible. And then after that, Medicare takes their negotiated discount, call it that dash there, okay, which is going to be a, a fairly significant negotiated rate cut on, on reimbursement for any of these services. And then they're going to split the bills with you 80-20. 
they're going to pay eight cents on the dollar and you're going to be responsible for 20 cents on the dollar. Now, the great thing about Medicare is it's an unlimited benefit. They're not going to cap you out at a million dollars or $500,000, but with that unlimited benefit comes unlimited exposure. And really why people look to pick up other coverage is certainly for this 1408 and the 176 in the event that you're in skilled nursing beyond 20 days. But more importantly, this 20%, because 20% of an office visit or a lab panel might not be so much, but if you're doing some outpatient procedures or any kind of diagnostic radiology, that could be, that could be pretty spendy. Um, even ambulance transport is pretty expensive. And so the, this is the, the thing that people really wanna give themselves a firewall around and protect themselves in terms of an unforeseen um, you know, financial event related to healthcare. So I am going to open up, you know what, um, Lev, I lost the chat function, so I can't see the chat yeah. unless I stop sharing my screen. Um, yeah. But if you wanna tell me any questions that have come in. Yes, there are three questions. Uh, the first one is, um, I'm oh, enrolled. I just found it. Here we oh, you, go. Saw, you see it? <laughs> yeah, I'm enrolled in Part A only, still getting medical insurance for employer, but over 75, that's great. Um, you know, the, late, the, the oldest client that I had that came to Medicare and fired up Part B um, was a gentleman who is 82 years old. He worked part-time at his local um, grocer in his, in his area where he lived, but he got full medical benefits. He didn't need to turn on Medicare Part B. And when he finally decided that he was gonna really retire and, and not, not even work part-time anymore, that's when he decided to come to Medicare Part, part B. But he was able to go to his employer and have them fill out the form that said, yep, this is where he's been since he's been 65. And so, and they, they certainly employed more than 20 employees. And so he was fine. The kind of coverage that doesn't reserve your right to come to Medicare late without incurring a penalty um, is if you're self-insured and on the Affordable Care Act, you can't hang on to that as primary insurance. You can't hang on to COBRA for more than seven months after loss of coverage. Um, and you can't hang on to retiree insurance. It can be secondary, but if you're not actively working and that, that group insurance isn't based on active work status, um, you got to get to Medicare. So the HSA, with HSA, it's not a six-month penalty. It's just a, you got to give yourself a six-month runway um, because what I've had people do is um, in their mind, they start to plan, right? And they say to themselves, okay, it's June. I'm going to re they turn 65 in June, let's say, and they decide they're going to retire at the end of the year and turn on their Medicare A and B benefits as of January 1st. But they continue to contribute to that HSA in the second half of the year tax free. And when they turn on their Medicare benefits come January, what ends up happening is they can start their Part B January 1st, but their Part A is going to get backdated to as far as six months or the first of the month in which they turn 65. So in that example, that individual would be, would their Medicare Part A would go effective retroactively on June 1st and those six months of tax-free contributions they'd have to pay back. Um, now the contributions you can hold on to while you're still in Medicare, you can use them for healthcare expenses, but you just can't get that tax-free contribution. So that's why they sort of tell you to, to plan you know, with giving yourself a six month buffer. I have had clients that have um, sort of preemptively uh, contributed the max amount to their HSA for a given year in advance of an event like that transpiring. Um, are there services or companies to help with, um, let me see, administering payment of medical billing? Um, Catherine, we may want to talk offline about that. There, there could be, um, but I'm not entirely sure I'm understanding your question specifically. So um, we might want to talk about that offline. Okay, I think that's all I see in terms of Medicare Part A and B. So we'll keep jumping ahead. Um, how is my sound? I noticed that I was cutting in and out a bit. Can everybody hear me okay? You've been good, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so now we know what Medicare Part A and B covers and we know what our out-of-pocket exposure is. 
So what some people look to do is they look to back it up by one of these Medicare supplements, okay? They're also known as Medigap policies. A little uh, nugget I'm gonna share with you all is that Medicare likes to call the same thing two different names to confuse the heck out of the people. But if somebody tells you a Medi they have a Medigap plan or a Medicare supplement, it's the same thing, okay? It, it bridges the gaps that Medicare leaves you open for, um, or it supplements what your out-of-pocket exposure is and helps pay for that, okay? So let's look at um, the, the 10 plans that, that are available currently um, on the Medigap landscape. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is these products are brought to you by private insurance companies, okay? But they are not your primary insurance. Your primary insurance in this scenario is Medicare. These products are standing behind Medicare to help pay for those out-of-pocket expenses that I just went through with you under Medicare Part A and B. So that's all those benefits here, okay? The Medicare Part A coinsurance for hospitalization, the Part B 20%, the Part B deductible, and all those things, okay? Now, on this landscape, these benefit packages are defined by Medicare. Medicare says to the insurance companies what each plan has to cover. Unfortunately, to confuse the public, they, they lettered them instead of giving them names. So when I refer to parts of Medicare, and there are four parts to Medicare, part A and B we just went through, okay? Part D is your prescription drug coverage, and part C is Medicare Advantage, okay? So there's four parts to Medicare. That shouldn't be confused with supplement plan A, B, C, D, F, G, K, L, M, and N, okay? So it can be a little bit confusing. So Medigap plans come in these 10 different packages. And I will tell you, up until probably this year, um, there were three that really dominated the market, meaning 90 plus percent of all the supplements sold by most of the insurance companies um, that you'll that will offer these products in Illinois. Um, most of the people bought these three plans, and why? Because if you look down the column, a hundred, pretty much a hundred percent is covered for most things. So it was easy to administer, easy to understand for people, um, and it was great coverage and protection. But there's one thing to note, particularly for those of you who are coming new to Medicare. If you're turning on your Part A benefits and aging into your eligibility as of January 1st, 2020 or after, there's three plans on this landscape that are no longer available for you to buy. Plan F, Plan C, and the high, there's an asterisk by Plan F. There's a high deductible version of F, okay? If you're in Medicare now and you have one of those plans, you can keep it. If you already have Medicare Part A and you later wanna turn on B and you wanna get one of these plans and you're over 65, you can get one. Um, but for anybody else who reached their age eligibility after January 1st of this year, new legislation went into effect that said those plans, those three, will no longer be marketed to newly eligible Medicare beneficiaries. Um, part of the reason is those three plans covered this one line item that no other supplements cover, and that's the Part B deductible, okay? That first $198 in billable charges under Part B. Uh, Medicare wants everybody to have a first dollar in experience, so they are no longer allowing supplements to cover that deductible, okay? But if you feel like you need something comparable to a Plan F, that literally will wipe out all that exposure that I talked about that would be your responsibility under Medicare Part A or B, you could choose a Medicare Part G supplement or Plan G supplement. Because if you look side by side, Plan G will cover you for all of those copays and coinsurance. Oop, there's one thing it doesn't cover, that empty box. If we go across, that's the Part B deductible of 198, okay? Now, another interesting option that you might choose is you might say, well, I don't really even go to the doctor very much, so paying the Part B deductible in, the, in a given year, you know, that, that might take me a while to do, but I'm not too concerned necessarily about a hospitalization or about the 20% coinsurance. And so, you know, one of the things you could think about is you could look at a plan N that will cost you less in premium, 
because it makes you responsible to pick up a few more things before the supplement would pay. One of those things, just like Plan G, is the Part B deductible of $198. The other thing is um, co-pays. So Plan N, just like Plan G, would pay your 20% coinsurance. But if you look down on the bottom of this chart, what Plan N says is that, here, I'm gonna try to move this, is that if you have office visits, the provider could charge you up to $20, but no more than for an office visit. Or if you go to the ER and then you're discharged or you're kept under observation and you're never admitted, you would have a $50 copay. So deductible plus copays and your premiums go down a little bit. There's also excess charges um, that you would potentially be responsible for, but Medicare doesn't really address excess charges in the majority of the supplements that they've defined are available for insurance companies to sell people. And so it's not something that we see happen very often, but what an excess charge is, is when doctors say that they'll accept Medicare, they're accepting Medicare's discounted reimbursement rate for their services. And if a doctor accepts Medicare assignment, it's a certain terminology, Medicare assignment, then they're accepting that discounted reimbursement rate as payment in full. If they wanna balance bill, because Medicare takes a pretty sizable discount on their reimbursement, Medicare says they can, but they can't balance bill the difference. They can only balance bill up to 15% of the Medicare negotiated rate. So they might participate in Medicare, but not accept assignment. Um, and so that excess charge would be billable to you. And in the case of Plan G, if you had a Plan G supplement, the supplement would pay for that 100%. If you were a Plan N holder, you'd be responsible for that excess charge. So let me give you an example. You go see your doctor, a specialist, and for that visit, they charge $500. They bill to Medicare, $500. And Medicare says that's wonderful, but for that visit, we're gonna reimburse at $300. And the doctor says, well, I think I'm talented and wonderful and I should, I'm gonna balance bill for that. Well, the first thing is, is they would usually be pretty transparent about the fact that they didn't accept Medicare assignment. But, but Medicare would allow them to balance bill up to 15% of the 300, not the five. So it would be another $45 and they'd have to file a stack of paperwork to collect it from you. So that's why we don't really see excess charges all that much, but it is a point of exposure for you. Now, another idea on this chart, if you notice, because the high deductible F supplement isn't available for new enrollees, um, they came to market with a high deductible G supplement because some people might say, you know, I see my primary care doc and one specialist in a year and I don't even want to, you know, have a supplement that covers all that. I don't even need that. I could pay my 20% coinsurance up to a certain amount. Well, that idea is present in this high deductible G where Medicare says, okay, if you pay the first 198, we'll start splitting the bills with you 80-20. You'll pay the 20% coinsurance on anything that you incur under Medicare Part B. If you're hospitalized, you're gonna have to pay that 1408 coinsurance for the first night. But that'll all count toward a plan deductible down here of 2340 in calendar year 2020. So your worst case scenario is 2340 if something really went sideways for you. But interestingly enough, when we start to look at the cost of some of these plans, that's how we start to narrow in what coverage is, is best suited to our personal needs. Think about your doctors, think about what you're dealing with from a healthcare perspective. But for a female turning 65, a plan F might run anywhere from 145 to $165 a month. A G would be around 150 15, 120, plan N would probably come in under 100, and a high deductible G would maybe be around $45, $50, depending on the carrier, depending on your zip code, whether or not you smoke tobacco, okay? But there you can see every time you're willing to take on a little more and out-of-pocket costs on the front end, deductible, deductible and coinsurance, maybe an excess charge, or 20% coinsurance up to this max amount, the insurance company is gonna reward you by bringing your premiums down. Now there's a couple of things to think about when you're shopping for one of these supplements. When you buy a given plan, you're joining a risk pool 
of everybody that, that, that bought that plan from that insurance company. And you're sharing claims as you age. And so the great thing about these plans is Medicare says to the insurance providers, you can never single somebody out for a rate increase based on their claims history. You can never drop them, okay? They're yours and you're theirs until you decide you wanna step away from the insurer. Um, and, you know, these prices will increase as you age, but they have to take you when you first come to Medicare, no questions asked. And there's a period of six months before you turn 65, six months after you turn 65, usually people start to look at these and make, make a plan choice, you know, when they come to Medicare. But you'll have up until six months after you acti activate Part B and step step away from your other coverage to choose any plan on this chart from any insurance company and nobody can ask you anything about your health. So that's the best time for you to shop around and get the most coverage you think you need at the best price because you literally are, are in an open enrollment window where they can't ask you anything about your health. Now, because these carriers are basically secondary bill payers. They're, they're taking on the responsibility of your financial exposure under Medicare. Medicare says to the companies, after that six month window closes, then you can ask people questions about their health. And so every insurance company in Illinois, except for one, and there's 39, about 39 companies that sell these products, every single one of them is going to ask you a standard set of questions they're they're all looking for the same stuff but it's about 15 20 questions on the application that you'll now have to answer and they're pretty much looking for no answers to all those questions um and if you can't answer no to all those questions they they simply might just not give you coverage they might say thanks but no thanks and deny you coverage um, now certainly if you go through that process outside of your open enrollment window um, you could potentially get rated up in price for things like tobacco use or being overweight. But generally, if, if you're dealing with some chronic things at the time, or you've been advised to have procedures that you just haven't had done yet, um, they're, they're, not gonna, they're just not going to issue you one of these policies if, if a certain set of circumstances around your health currently exist. So just know that you can... These, these policies are month to month, so you can change them any month out of the year, but your health is really going to be your ability to move freely between plans throughout your lifetime. And even if you're with a single carrier and you want to move between that carrier, but let's say you started with a high deductible G and now you want to go to a plan N, even that carrier that you have that product with is still going to ask you health questions. Okay, um, now here's the good news. Remember how I said Medicare says to the insurers, you can never drop anybody, right? So even if you were denied coverage, you applied and were denied, um, they can't hold that against you. They can't raise your rates. Um, they won't kick you off the plan. Um, so it's just important to retain the coverage you have until the new coverage that you've applied for has been issued, okay? So that's really in a nutshell how Medicare supplements work or Medigap plans. They bridge the gap on that 20% coinsurance, okay? They effectively will help pay for that in full. Maybe you'll have a copay if you're on something like a plan N or maybe you'll pay that amount if you're on a high deductible plan up to that max. They're all gonna pay this 1408 for you. Many of them, the majority of them are gonna pay this in full, okay? But generally across the board, if you've aged into Medicare after January 1st of this year, you're gonna be responsible to pay that first 198. And then you can choose very, very lavish coverage or very Spartan coverage. But now you've got backup to Medicare A and B, okay? I'm gonna to go to the chat real quick and see if we have any questions about supplements. Um, so I, I, I had a question about what plans weren't available anymore. For new applicants since January based on the new macro legislation and yes it is plan C, plan F, and then what was the high deductible version of F. Okay but only those three so all the other ones are available. Now not every insurance company in Illinois might choose to sell all the plans. You know Medicare doesn't force them to offer all of them but they most of them offer all the popular ones. 
So now we've got our backup to medical coverage, but we still don't have prescription drug coverage because Medicare Part A and B was never designed to help with prescription drugs. And so not until 2006 did Medicare recognize the escalating prices of prescription drugs in this country was really dis being a disadvantage to the senior population. And so Medicare Part D came on the scene. And this is the one part of coverage that when you do step away from other creditable coverage that has prescription drug coverage baked in, like employer group coverage, and you turn on Part A and B, you got to get Part D or some equivalent of Part D, maybe an Advantage plan, um, with, within 63 days or you'll start to incur a penalty on that. So let's talk about the rules of the road for Medicare Part D. Medicare Part D is, is solely there to help you pay for prescription drugs. Okay, it is also a product that is offered through private insurance companies, and it's the same suspects that you're going to see selling Medicare supplements. Um, there are different formularies for every single plan. So if you've talked to friends or confided, confided with family members that have crossed this bridge before you, they might say, oh, all the drug plans are the same. They're actually not the same. They can, they can vary quite extensively. Medicare sets a master formulary in about October. Of, the, of every calendar year that covers all the prescription drugs that most seniors are on once they get to Medicare age. And they tier those drugs on a five tier scale between tier, tier one and tier five. And the higher you go up in, in the tier, the more the drug typically costs from a retail perspective. So conversely, the more you'll pay out of pocket for, um, in a copay when you go to fill it. But every, <clears throat> every insurance company can decide off of that master formulary which drugs they want to cover. And some get really competitive with the tier one, tier two generic category. And some decide that they're really going to go after the market population that takes brand name drugs. And they will get very aggressive in how they cost share with you on tier three, tier four brand name drugs. And so it's really important to use something like the Medicare plan finder, which is what I use to help my clients initially pick a drug plan because you're locked into a part D drug plan for a calendar year. And so the best you can do is the best you can do, which is base your plan choice on the prescription drugs that you're currently on, okay? Now there's four stages of coverage, which I'm gonna run through in a bit, but Medicare actually tracks the value of the prescription drugs that you're filling every month, and they move you through stages of coverage during the calendar year based on the drugs that you're filling, their, their retail value. And at different stages, you might have different cost contributions that you're responsible for. As I mentioned before, upon coming off of other coverage and firing up Medicare Part B, which typically is the, is the same time, um, you have to jump into a Medicare Part D, they give you 63 days to make a plan choice, um, or you will incur a late enrollment penalty. And Medicare Part D is something that you can join if you forgot to sign up for it. You can join during the annual election period, which is the Met or Medicare Open Enrollment as it's called. Um, and that is every calendar year between October 15th and December 7th. Um, you can either change your drug plan, no questions asked, so your health isn't a consideration, um, or you can come into Medicare Part D if you forgot to sign up when you initially enrolled in Medicare. Um, at that point, though, your benefits won't start, your new benefits, until January 1st of the following calendar year. Um, and whatever penalty you've accrued in the time that you didn't have a, dr have a drug plan, that you should have had a drug plan, they're gonna add up that penalty and tack it onto your premium every month in perpetuity for the rest of your life. So it's not a one-time hit, folks, and it's definitely something you don't wanna to have to contend with. Um, I've seen people that really weren't taking many prescriptions, never thought they needed Part, part D, didn't know about the late enrollment penalty, and for years and years, you know, just kept filling their one or two generic prescriptions out of their pocket. Well, that didn't cost them very much, but then, a very expensive drug came out of left field. And if it was mid-plan year, they had to wait till the annual election period. Then they started their plan. And for you know the 10, 12 years that they didn't have insurance, they now you know, accrued a late enrollment penalty that was in excess of what their Part D 
premium for the insurance coverage was per month. So hate to see that happen. Um, you know, the bottom line is there's, the insurance companies have done a good thing in that they've recognized that many people are aging well and are not on prescription drugs like, you know, the generation before them. And so there are many people that come to Medicare and really aren't taking anything, or maybe they're taking one thing and it's, it's you know, in, inconsequential, right? So they've decided to come at the market with insurance coverage for Part D that is very low cost. I think the cheapest plan this year is about $13.20 a month, but then it goes all the way up to $133 or $135 a month. Now you have to be taking some pretty serious prescription drugs to need a $130 drug plan, but it's there if you need it. Um, and then there's everything in between. So these plans really do vary quite a bit. So let's quickly talk about the stages of coverage because this is important and no doubt if you've conferred with friends or family members about how this all works, somebody who's fallen into the donut hole or the coverage gap has told you, you know, how horrible that is and how you want to avoid it. <clears throat> so most drug plans this year, about three quarters, I would say, um, if not more, have an annual deductible. Um, a lot of times though, that deductible, it triggers on the higher tier drugs. So let's just talk about the tiers real quick. Tier one, tier two are your preferred generics. They've been in generic status for a long, long time. If They're not very expensive from a retail value perspective. And so when you go to fill them, you might be in a part D plan that if you go to a preferred pharmacy partner, you can fill that drug for no cost. Um, Non-preferred generics might cost you, you know, a couple of dollars, you know, three to seven dollars, but they're not gonna be super expensive. Um, a tier three is when you get in the brand category. So, you know, there's Part D plans out there um, this year that cover tier three preferred brand name drugs that might be worth hundreds of dollars. Once you get through your deductible phase, they might start charging you anywhere between 25 to, you know, $70 a month to fill that preferred brand name. So it varies. And then non-preferred brands um, typically are those that have you know, just come out of clinical trial. They're advertised on TV by famous people. Tier threes are advertised on TV, but they don't use a famous spokesperson. And then I find the ones that they really want you to try, they put a famous spokesperson on the commercial. Um, and then your tier five specialty meds, this is gonna be things like oral chemotherapy, um, it's going to be anti-rejection medication after transplant, maybe AIDS medication, you know, things that are on more of a, a higher specialty tier and a, a little more rare, okay? So the tiers um, will correlate to what you pay for the prescription drugs from a copay perspective, but a lot of the medications that have, a, or a lot of the Part D plans that have deductible, that deductible will be triggered by drugs that are in the three, four, five categories. Not all, you know, some have the deductible trigger right away, but most of them don't trigger, but on the higher tiers. And this year, Medicare set that annual deductible on Medicare Part D at $435, okay? So a lot of plans have that deductible. Some have no deductible, but you're going to pay a higher premium for those plans, and that might make sense for you for your prescription drug list. And a, there's a few, very few, that have a, a reduced deductible. Um, so once you get past that deductible, then you go into what's called the initial stage of coverage. And, and, and when you pick up your prescription drugs, you might be getting a two, three hundred dollar drug for a forty dollar copay or a twenty five dollar copay. It just depends on what tier it's on and how that plan treats it. And the interesting part when you're in this stage of coverage is Medicare doesn't track what you're paying in copays out of your pocket. They're tracking the value of that drug. So let's say you're filling $500 worth of drugs, but you're only paying out of your pocket $75. That's a pretty good deal. But Medicare's tracking 500 every time you fill your list, okay? And when you reach a total of $4,020 worth of drugs in acquired retail value, then they're gonna throw you into something called the coverage gap or the donut hole. And your cost share now is gonna flip to 25% of the retail price of that drug. Okay, so that's why you want to try to avoid the coverage gap or donut hole. And we use a lot of different strategies with our clients um, that help them not only picking the right Part D plan that can help push that donut hole entrance off, you know, as far off into the year as possible, but sometimes 
clients of mine will use strategies like using a wholesale coupon like GoodRx or Blink Health, um, or they'll go online and fill their medications through, you know, like a Canadian drug online or, you know, whatever the case may be. But, you know, you can use any strategy at your disposal to acquire your prescription drugs at the lowest cost. You know, Medicare says you have to be in Part D or you'll get penalized, but if filling your medications and running, you know, two thirds of your medications through your Part D plan and then acquiring the rest of them using a good RX coupon, a prescription in cash, um, will help you avoid the donut hole because that retail calculation won't factor in to the drugs you're filling through good RX every month. Then, you know, if that works for you, then you then do that. Um, so there's all kinds of different strategies that we try to look at. The biggest and most important one though, and part of the reasons why Medicare established these stages of coverage is because they really want to drive people to take more generic drugs. So immediately one of the things that I'll look at is when I'm running someone's prescription drug list through the Medicare plan finder to help them make a plan choice, if there is a generic equivalent of that, of that medication and they're not taking it, before they make their, their plan decision, they might wanna to talk to their doctor about switching to the generic to see if they can tolerate it. Sometimes you don't have that option. There's only a brand name available, but where you do, you might wanna see if there's an equivalent generic that you can switch to. It'll certainly bring your cost share down in this stage of coverage, and it might help you avoid this stage of coverage entirely. Now, when you're here paying more for all of your prescription drugs, your next sort of benchmark is gonna be this 6350. And between these two stages of coverage, that's gonna be the combined out-of-pocket costs that you reach where you've paid out-of-pocket plus some of the cost sharing that you've received in, in these stages of coverage from your insurance. And when, that, when you hit that threshold, then you get into catastrophic coverage and the price of all your prescription drugs, drugs goes down um, certain amount for generic, certain amount for, for brands, they're bo you know, both under five and $10 and no more than 5% of retail. So this is when you really get rate relief. The unfortunate part about this system is that a lot of times people won't fall into the coverage gap until late summer, early fall, and then they'll never get out of it by the end of the year. So they'll never get into this stage of coverage. And if they do, they might be here for only one month where they get rate relief. Um, and then this number resets down to zero as of January 1st, that 4,020 goes down to zero. And Medicare adjusts these numbers slightly every year. But you know, every year you start out at zero and then you kind of work your way up. Now, unfortunately, I have seen people that are taking very expensive prescription drugs and they'll blow through all these stages of coverage in their first or second fill. Um, but you know, me Medicare has designed this system um, to, to help give people rate relief when they have significant prescription drug expense and to drive us all to look at um, moving from brand names to generic when it's possible, okay? So that's how Medicare Part D works. Um, you've got your tiers. You know that you've got to, you know, get in, get in and out at the right time. And then you have an annual do-over. When we're starting out or even during the annual Medicare enrollment, I go to this, this button down in the far bottom right find health and drug plans. If you click into that, it'll ask you either to log in with, continue without logging in or to create an account. Now, next year before the annual enrollment in the fall this year, they may do away with this ability to log in. I've heard rumors that they might, they might force you to create an account. For anybody who's got a fairly robust list of drugs that they fill every month, I would encourage you to, to create an account anyway, because all it's going to do is give you the ability to log back into the plan finder with your username and password and pull up all your prescription drugs. Your list will be there. You won't have to recreate it every time you want to look at this. So it's good to create an account anyway, and then you can log in with your news username and password. It'll then ask you for your zip code. It'll ask you to type in all your medications, the dose, the frequency that you take it, and then it'll ask you to pick a couple preferred pharmacies that you like to fill at. And then it'll rank order all the prescription drugs that are available in your zip code that cover your specific list of drugs. You, you click into one of them and you might see a chart like this. Now this person is filling these medications, okay? Their Eliquis is you know, pretty spendy and there's no generic equivalent of that yet. Um, they've got the Pro-Air generic, but you know, what this plan is, is 
demonstrating, and you can't really see the premium, it's about $22 a month for this plan. But what that $22 a month is allowing this person to do is acquire $546 worth of drugs for $50 copay. Now, they're gonna pay for the Eloquist probably and the Pro Air. those might be tier three. And if we had a larger screen grab from medicare.gov, you'd see this, but lower below this chart, the drugs will be tiered by plan. Um, but basically it'll tell you, and I ran this in March, so it was assuming I jumped into this plan as of April 1st. But what it was basically telling me is that based on my list, I was gonna fill my deductible the first, First month I filled the medication and I was going to be in this initial stage of coverage or what they call cost after deductible and pay this amount to fill everything. So that's a pretty good deal. But then lo and behold, as Medicare adds up 546, 546, 546 every month that I fill my meds, I'm going to get to that 4,020 by about the you know fifth or sixth month that I'm filling. And then I'm going to start to pay $132 for that same list of drugs. Okay, and unfortunately on this particular plan coming in in April, I'm not going to hit the cut of the year. So, um, or I'm sorry, I'm not going to get out of the coverage gap by the end of the year, so I won't have any rate relief there. But it usually gives you your total drug and premium cost all in, and that's the number that you really want to look at, because your cost to fill the, fill the drugs as well as your cost for the insurance is really your true out-of-pocket cost, and that's what you should look at when you're looking at the medicare.gov plan finder. But again, this is something that I usually help my clients with initially and then in years following um, as they're in Medicare and need to make shifts. Medicare doesn't want you to have to feel locked in, okay? That's why you get a do-over every year on this Medicare Part D. People go on and off medications, brands go generic, the insurance plans change annually. And so they wanna give people the flexibility to revisit and change up their drug coverage annually. So now you've got Medicare A and B, okay? You've got it backed up by a supplement and you've got your drug coverage. And each of these has an associated premium per month. And as you age, your Medigap plan might you know, increase. We tell our clients budget five to 8%. You know, We like the big companies with the big risk pools who's, who've demonstrated a, a track record in the business where they take modest rate increases. And I think you know that, and, and have sharp prices, and those will typically be the ones that we steer people to once they've chosen the plan that they want. Um, but as you age, those will inch up in price slightly. Now you might get to your late 70s, 80s, and you're still only going to the doctor once or twice a year, but your fixed costs for premiums are now a lot higher than they were when you turned 65. And you might decide that there's a more cost-effective way for you to pay for your health care coverage. And just because you're a relatively low consumer of health care. And you might decide that $5,000 a year that you're spending an insurance premium, you'd rather stick that in a cookie jar and pay as you go. And there is a model like that. It's called Medicare Advantage. Now, this is a completely different concept, okay? These are a package of benefits that are brought to you by a private insurance company that have gone into contract with the federal government to take over for your care. So you still gotta pay for Medicare Part B, okay? Nobody gets away paying that, in, that premium, gets away from paying that premium. But in this scenario, that premium is being passed over to a private insurer, okay? Same suspects that are gonna sell you the drug plans or the supplements are in this business too. Okay, lots of choices. And they have HMO type plans and PPO type plans. Um, they tend to be the most popular. They also have fee for service plans and you know Medicare savings account type plans. But generally, most people usually fall with an HMO or a PPO when they're looking at Medicare Advantage. But this package of benefits is now administered by a private insurance company. They're getting your Part B premium, they're getting some tax dollars, so they're well-funded to take care of you. But by law, they have to give you all your coverage under Medicare Part A, all your coverage under Medicare Part B, because you're paying into Medicare for that. And they have to give you, well, they don't have to give you, but the majority of the plans have a qualified Part D drug coverage plan. Sometimes uh, these plans will be without drug coverage, but that unless you have other creditable coverage, that's not that's not the kind of plan you want to sign up for. So, um, a Part D plan or Part C plan that includes A, B, and D 
um, that's either an HMO or a PPO is really um, a nice alternative to perhaps, you know, depending on your health circumstance and your use of the healthcare systems and your mix of doctors, um, this might be an alternative way for you to pay for your care. However, there are some rules to Medicare Advantage as well. The very first thing you need to understand is you've now signed up to stay within a doctor network, okay? Over here, any doctor that accepts Medicare. Over here, you're in an HMO or a PPO. So by nature of that, you're gonna be in a more restrictive doctor network. Now, your PPO is gonna be a little more flexible than your HMO. Right? You're not going to need a referral from your primary care doctor when you're in a PPO. You will have out-of-network benefits, but your cost sharing when you go out of network is going to be a little higher than if you were to stay in network. So you have flexibility, but you just got to be careful because you really do want to do most of your services in network. On an HMO, you got to stay in network. You only have one in-network benefit, and you're going to be navigated by, by your primary care doctor. Some of these Part C Advantage plans might have no premium or a very low premium. So while you're not writing a check to an insurance company every month in addition to paying for Medicare, or you might be writing a very low check or a smaller check than you would for a supplement and a drug plan, you will have co-payments for services as you use the healthcare system. Okay, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. But just like employer group plans, these plans will have capped exposure. So some people will say to me, well, that sounds good, Robin, you know, lower premiums, pay as I go, but gosh, what if I get cancer? Or what if I'm hospitalized and have to have surgery? Or what if, what if, right? So for the what if, these plans have a max out of pocket amount, where if you pay in co-pays and co-insurance and you hit the max, that's where you stop and the plan kicks in and pays 100% for you. Nice thing about these is Part D is included. Okay, and you have the annual election period to come in and out of them. So just like the drug plans, these run on a calendar year. You can come into them under, you know, your initial enrollment in Medicare, any kind of special enrollment. If you're later coming off of employer coverage after age 65, you can get one of these. But then you can only revisit your coverage under Medicare Part C annually between October 15th and December 7th. And because these are administered by a private insurance company and the federal government is no longer your primary insurer, of course, they're gonna define how these co-payments for services look, okay? Under the Medicare reimbursement model, right? But they're gonna, they're gonna decide that. And so this is what a PPO summary of benefits might look like, okay? You have in and out of network benefits. If you stay in network on things, pretty much all your preventative care is gonna be covered. But look, if you land in the hospital on Medicare Advantage, you might pay $250 a night for the first seven nights. That idea of that $1,408 copay under Medicare Part A goes away. Now you're paying to the insurance company this amount for a hospitalization. You know, for a lab test, it might be a $13 copay. For x rays, $16. For an ambulance ride, $200. But all of these amounts on this plan would count toward an annual max out of pocket of $3,800 on this plan. If you go in and out of network, and this is a very old plan, most of the Part C plans that, have, that are a PPO plan design, they don't have an unlimited in and out of net, network max out of pocket. They, they typically have a ceiling. But a lot of times it can be double of what the in-network max is. So you truly will extract the most value on these plans, as you can see, is if, if you stay in network. Okay, but it is an interesting way to pay for your health insurance, an alternative way to pay for your health insurance. But here's the rules of the game. You gotta be enrolled in Part A and B. Okay, nobody gets away from paying that Part B premium. You actually have to live in the plan service area. So unlike um, drug plans that are sold by state, Medicare Advantage plans are sold by county. So you have to live within the county that the plan is available. You can use it anywhere, but you gotta be in, you gotta, there will only be a certain set of plans available to you in your county. You can't have end stage renal disease currently, but Medicare has been in discussions about changing this. So we may, this may no longer be an exclusion um, for Medicare Part C enrollment 
um, during this annual enrollment period. We'll have to see if that ends up happening for sure, but there was a lot of discussion that they weren't gonna make this a disqualifier to get into Medicare Advantage anymore. It's always offered by private insurance companies, and you can think about these plans as replacing Medicare because a primary insurer is now gonna be your, I'm sorry, a, a private insurer is now gonna be your primary insurance. Many of you who have talked to friends and family members about what they have, they may have told you, I don't pay anything for my insurance and I get free dental and vision and hearing and silver sneakers, gym club membership, and I get free money to spend over the counter at CVS or, or Walmart mail order um, every quarter. Those types of bells and whistles are added extra benefits that insurance companies build into Medicare Advantage to entice people to try these plans. Again, this is a highly competitive space. It's one of the ways that they can differentiate themselves and their plans from Medicare and from one another. And so you might get some added extra benefits in these plans. Medicare covers you for your eyes, your ears, and your teeth um, for illness and injury. Okay, but they're not gonna pay for your teeth cleanings every year. They're not gonna do your annual audiology exams. They're not gonna give you your basic refraction exam for your new prescription glasses every year. That you have to get separate insurance for. But they will cover you for things that degrade your teeth, your health, um, your vision related to your health, your hearing. So if you have hearing loss or if you're in a car act related to a virus or if you have um, you get into a car accident and you knock out your lower set of teeth, or if you need cataract surgery, or you have macular degeneration, all of those types of things would be covered under Medicare. Okay, so this is more of the preventative stuff that, that is built into Medicare Part C. Okay, so those are your options. Medicare Part A and B, really, really good, but not complete, okay? And so what we do is we add our drug coverage, and we back ourselves up for that unlimited exposure under A and B with some, some Medigap plan. We can choose very lavish coverage that basically pays for everything outside of the deductible, or we can get very Spartan coverage that requires us to pay a little bit more ahead of the plan kicking in and covering us. Or we can try Medicare Advantage on for size. We can pay as we go. Maybe all of our doctors that are important to our care are within the same medical group. Maybe we have a few that are in different medical groups, and so a PPO plan design could work for us. But generally, we like the idea of paying less for insurance and more paying for services as we incur them with a max out of pocket in mind to protect us. But either way, it's an either or choice, and all of these products are sold to you by private insurance companies. It's where I play, where I can help people kind of cut through all the clutter and all the mail that they're getting and hopefully get to a plan design that is suited to their needs, their budget, and their lifestyle. Um, I'm gonna jump to some questions real quick and see if I can't answer some things. Um, okay, so how much does the carrier matter in choosing a Medigap policy? A lot. Um, my professional opinion is it matters a lot. Because here's the thing, these benefits are standardized because Medicare defines what they cover. So really the only difference between companies is price. And if they can't offer any other benefits and they have no other doctor network, it's any doctor that accepts Medicare, the way that new entrants into that marketplace compete to try to get market share and get people to enroll in their plans is they undercut the market by a couple dollars and they try to pay broker bonuses to people like me, okay? So you wanna work with an agent that you know is gonna have your best interests at mind. I have a fiduciary responsibility, just like your financial advisor, to do what's best for you. Um, but I also think that track record in the business is important because you have to remember, you're gonna be in a risk pool where you can't be singled out based on your claim status and you can never be dropped. So I want to sign my clients up with companies that know how to manage to that risk pool. And I can't see that with people that have only been in the business one or two or three years, okay? I wanna see at least an eight year rate increase history so I know that that, that, that company 
um, has the wherewithal to be in this business for a while, because if you get one of these policies, you're probably gonna hang on to it for a while. So that's important to look at and any agent should be able to share that data with you. Um, the other thing that I think is important is the financial rating of, of the parent company. So an S&P rating, an A Invest rating, and honestly, I like to only deal with A-rated companies. I mean, if it's a difference of $5 per month or $3 per month or $7, $8 per month, which really that's all we're talking about here, folks, on a plan G across 39 companies, um, that might be the variance you see. I, I don't know about you, but personally, I'd rather go with an A-rated company. Um, that's got a, a long-standing track record in the business. Because the other thing that's important to that is that will reflect in their rate increases year over year. Okay, if they've got a massive risk pool, you know, they're not going to need to jump your rates 10, 12% every year. But if they've got a little tiny risk pool because they just got into the business, one guy gets cancer, one gets hit by a bus, one gets, you know, a snake bite, <laughs> those claims are being shared and that's going to reflect in the rates going up. Okay, an extreme example, but but that's one way that I help my clients kind of narrow down your choices when it comes to companies in selecting Medigap policies. Um, so another person asked if someone had an employer policy and now they're going on to part B and they wanna pick up a supplement plan, um, would they have, would they potentially be denied coverage based on their health? No, because by coming off of employer coverage and turning on Part B, you're starting the clock on that six month um, open enrollment window for a Medigap plan. So for six months, you can move around as much as you want. You could make six different plan changes if you wanted to. I don't know why you would want to, but you could. And every single time you applied in that six month window, nobody could ask you anything about your health. But when that window closes, you can still continue to change your plan throughout your lifetime, but now you're gonna to have to answer the questions on the application related to your health. And like I said, in most cases, you're only gonna be rated up for things like tobacco use or um, maybe if you're overweight, but if you've got other existing health challenges, that might just preclude you from coverage. Like you might not be eligible to get coverage and they could just deny you and say, thanks, but no thanks. We don't wanna be your secondary bill payer. Okay, so you got to be cognizant of, of those choices when you initially enroll. But certainly when you are first coming off of employer coverage, you'll have that same open enrollment. So I get this question a lot of times, you know, what percentage of the population actually chooses um, original Medicare and Medigap in a drug plan versus Medicare Advantage? And I can tell you what the insurance industry is projecting. They're projecting about a 60-40 split by 2022. Um, and I would say we're on track for that. Um, but I still do, I mean, right now, I would still say I do about 70-30 um, Medicare supplements more than Medicare Advantage plans. Um, you know, certainly there's a lot of transacting on Medicare Advantage plans in the fall of the year when people can come in and out of those plans. And so, you know, I'll do more Medicare Advantage enrollments during that time. Um, you know, and you can look this up on um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, but there's actually stats by state. So in Illinois, we're still at maybe like um, a 65-35 split with, you know, 65 being Medicare supplements and original Medicare. Um, but that's kind of inching upward and it's, it's gonna level out here, I think in the next few years, because we have a very, very competitive offering across insurance carriers. In other states, that's not the case um, because some states that have larger populations of, um, of more aged people, their Medicare supplements will cost more. So for example, I've had a lot of clients that migrate from the Midwest to Florida, you know, in retirement. And on average, I see Medigap plans in Florida that are priced across the board, um, probably $50 higher than they are in the state of Illinois, depending on the plan, but, but generally, it's about that much more. And Medicare Advantage, conversely, is very big business there because it's, it's simply more affordable for a lot of people. Um, but again, it, like the, it varies by state, but the, it's a good kind of ballpark. Once again, thanks everybody. Thanks Robin and no um, have a great evening everyone. Have a great night. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.